So as you all know, we went to Fabtech 2019, and while we were there, we shot some classes with ESOB University, seven of them to be exact. Bob Moffat did a couple classes, I did some, Man Cub was there, uh, teamed up with some of uh, the ESOB Elite partners. But today's episode, we have Jimmy McKnight with Arc Junkies Podcast is doing a panel interview with Ian Johnson of Big Tire Garage, Bob Moffat with Weld.com, Man Cub or Mike Beecher of Weld.com, uh, Sydney with Georgia Trade School, and Joe Young from AWS and myself. So it's a pretty good interview or a pretty good panel discussion about you know, what you guys should do when you're getting out of school, how to find a job, what type of stuff you need, what do you need for your toolbox, some of those items. So without further ado, check out the episode. How's everybody doing? All right. We're talking about employment after welding school. Where to go with all different kinds of ways you could actually do this. Uh, we have experts up here that are gonna kinda help direct us. That's really sensitive, isn't it? She's a sensitive one, huh? Sensitive. All right. Um, right after welding school, it can be very, very confusing. So, Bob, what would be your advice? And feel everybody, please feel free to chime in at any time. What would be some of your advice to direct a student that may not know what aspect that they want to go into? Don't be late. Don't fly United. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, United. Uh, you know. We talked about this numerous times. It's always that promptness, that's uh, dependability. Uh, Ian and I had some really good conversations over the years about dependability. You've got to be there. I mean, we can't plan work. We can't schedule work. We can't do things unless we have staff on board and, and make things flow. So I think that's one of the biggest things that we're suffering that I've noticed. And, uh, you know, we joke about our, my, my arrival yesterday being so late. Gee whiz, that's, that was horrible. Uh, but I, I think this generation is just it's like a bunch of part-timers, you know. I like to be places on time. I felt really bad yesterday when I walked up. Uh, you know, I like to be there on time. I like to stay a little bit late. I like to uh, do a complete job, do, go through the whole gamut. So be prepared, show up on time. I would say probably for me, I... I uh, I sort of live my life this way, and I tell everyone that I that wants to listen the same thing is, don't tell me what you can do, show me what you can do. So let your work speak for yourself. That's the beauty of a trade. Any trade, you can always sort of like lay it on the line. You can show what you can do. You don't have to spend time talking about all the things you can do. Just work and let your work speak for itself. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, just me personally, I tell my students the first day of class that uh, today is day one of your 20-week interview. So show me your work ethics. Work ethics is probably the, the biggest component. I mean, if you've got a passion and drive to learn how to weld, I can teach you how to weld. The same thing with an employer, but work ethics are gonna go a lot farther. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I, I think just like Bob said, to echo that, show up on time, do a little bit more than it's expected of you, uh, be reliable, be dependable. You know, you could be the best welder out there, but if you don't show up for work, I'll take somebody that doesn't have the skills that's there every day. Uh, I'd go out and talk to employers all the time. Hey, man, what are the skills you're looking for that I can teach my program, be it tape measure, fit up, fabrication, material prep? He says, just send me a good person. Most of the time, nine times out of ten, just send me a good person. Send me somebody that's honest, dependable, can show up to work, and is, is willing to work. Uh, so I think that's the, that's the biggest thing that you can do. Add to your, uh, your resume and then have your instructors backing for that because I could find my students with the work ethics. They'd be hired before the program was over. Right? The rest of them are out looking for work because they didn't show those skills. They didn't show that need, that want while they were in class. Pride. Pride in your work. Pride is everything in your work. Show initiative. Be the first one to jump out in front of everybody. Try to lead, lead them. Be a great example. Always um, do your best. Show up with a great learning attitude. Just listen to your older peers all the time. Find the smartest guy when you go to a fab shop. I mean, I was scared at my first fab shop. I didn't know. I was asking around. Who was the smartest guy in this shop? Then I would go over there and just be a laborer, be the helper. I didn't have no work experience back in 2009. So I got taught by so much good things by this guy named Anastasio. I mean, that's the best way to get started because all these old tricks, they're dying. I mean, guys, we need to learn off that stuff before they all retire. It's coming fast and we need to keep going on this. All right. One thing we used to say at the shipyard is hire for attitude and train for skill. So it kind of echoes the same sentiment that these guys are saying and that's you know, you can be the smartest guy, the best guy, the best welder out there, but if you have a crap attitude and you can't work with your team, you can't work for your boss, then nobody wants you. 
and that echoes everywhere else in the industry because your reputation really speaks for itself. So your attitude first and foremost and being there early I think would be the two things that uh, anybody would agree is, is crucial in this industry nowadays. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful skill to have, welding. You can go just about anywhere with it. I think for me and people I see around, just be willing to learn from other folks that have been in this and had a lot of time into it and then chase down an opportunity. You never know where it might take you. I mean, I didn't think I'd be sitting in this chair today. Um, so now say you've already figured out the area of the industry that you want to go into and you get the opportunity, you get the call for the interview. Even though you're being asked questions, you should also ask questions during the interview. Uh, what do you feel are some questions that you should be asking while you're being interviewed? Too close. It's called sign. Are you going down there, Luke? <laughs> At least. Do a little research. I mean, you got to look into the job you're applying for. And I've interviewed a lot of people uh, at the college for various positions as a department chair. I had to cover a lot of areas and move people around. And I was interviewing a gentleman one day. I mean, he had all the degrees. He had the suit, man. He had everything. And I could tell where he was going. And after about five minutes, I said, so where, where do you see our program in about three years in mechatronics? What's mechatronics? And I said, hey, thanks for coming in today. You know, do some background. I mean, you want to, it's just a, any job, you know. You want to go in and if you're applying for a job, you, you, you want this to be a position or is this just a temporary fix of something? Is this just temporary income? Uh, you know, learn as much as you can. If I'm going to go interview with Jimmy, I want to know his background. I want to know what he does. I want to know if there's something along the line in my background or something that could be an asset to his organization, I want to know what it is, and I want to know how to talk about it and ease into it and maybe suggest it or talk around it or something, have an intelligent conversation. But don't go in blind to a company as an easy fix. You're going to get, you're going to get picked apart really got quickly. To do some prep. You really do. I think probably uh, one of the most important things that anyone can ask in an interview would be, you know, how can I, they, you ask back the question, right? So how, where, where, where am I going to advance in this position? You may be interviewing for one position, but you may, there may be opportunity beyond the position that you're applying for. So by opening up with that question, be like, well, what else can I do? What, else, what other opportunities are there here? We, we, I listen to the podcast, Jimmy, here all the time. We talk about when you go to interview and you talk about getting your CWI. And a lot of people, that's, it, that, if that might not be on the list of job descriptions that you're applying for but if you put that out there that hey yes I understand this is just production MIG welding but you know I'm really interested in learning the following processes that may open a door that might get you for in that first door and then retained because they know that you're interested in picking up more skill inside that company yeah same thing uh, you got to think when you go to sit down for a job interview the employer is going to be interviewing you for that specific position to make sure you're a good fit for the company you also want to ensure that, or that they are a good fit for you. So you can go to glassdoor.com and you can research employee reviews, okay? Marketing is gonna not tell the, like, the, the best truth of the company because they want to put themselves out there as, as number one. But if you can find employee reviews on that company, you'll find out exactly what's going on behind that door. Uh, I kind of, when I, when I got into teaching, I, I did that. I jumped on the, uh, uh, the first opportunity that was available for me. And probably after about three, four months, I went and checked the, the reviews on that, and they weren't too pretty. So prior to getting employment somewhere else, I did a whole lot of research, probably more research on them than they did on me. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest things, especially if you want to advance yourself in the career. I mean, welding is a great opportunity, but there's, there's a lot more you can do with it outside of running a bead, flipping your hood down, grinding, prepping, you know, day in and day out. You can start moving up that ladder. So echo find out you know what opportunities are available will they send you for training will they invest in you um, just different things like that find out you know if there's any anything else that you can uh, that you can do for that company that they'd be willing to allow you to afford you the opportunity always bring your tools guys in the car always have them on case because nine out of time time nine out of ten times guys they're going to ask you hey you got yourself with you let's go take a weld test before that if they have a um, if they're on the phone with them ask them if they hey what type of welding you do 
So if you know what type of welding they're doing, go start practicing in your garage, wherever. That's When I know that they were doing that, I went and bought the cheapest welding machine as I could, but like an old one, and just started practicing in my shop and got ready, got mentally ready for that test. So when I went in there, I could go ahead and bang that test out and be good with it. And also, if there's more than multiple jobs, just go to them and learn from them and see what knowledge you can take with you, even if you're not interested in that job. You're going to learn information off older people. You might like that job, but instead of this job, you're like, oh man, I love TIG welding. You know what I mean? Okay, I don't want to do that. I know enough about it. I'm going to go over here and learn from MIG, stick, and all that, and fitting off this other guy, because you've been doing TIG welding a lot. Always learn different trades, different skills, mechanics, diesel, tool, tool and die maker. I mean, learn everything. The more you open your mind to, more, more money you're going to get, more knowledge. Knowledge is key, guys, for sure. A couple things I tell our students as far as asking questions. Number one would definitely be, um, this, is, this is an opportunity for you to show the employer you're going to give them some, some quality work for the time that they're paying you. So it's not really about what can you get out of a company, it's more what can the company get out of you. Because they're paying you, so that's what you're getting. You're getting their benefits, you're getting a steady job, so this is your time to show them that you're going to provide some quality time for them. Um, and some quality work. So I always tell students a couple things you can ask. Uh, and one of the most impressive things I've ever been asked in an interview was, what's your biggest problem and how can I help you with it? So just showing them that your attitude is focused on what their goals are. Like, what, what are your goals in the next year? Um, how am I being evaluated? What's, what's, a comp like, what's a regular day like for me? These are all pretty normal questions that any employer is going to be happy to see that you're being you're already a company minded person you're already trying to figure out like how can I give you the most bang for your buck so you're already paying me so how do I make the best out of those dollars you know what's a problem how can I fix it let me try to find some solutions for you before I even get in the door um, another thing I tell people is to check their social media like before you walk in the interview because they're always posting about projects or something big that's being completed recently so there's always cool things out there that are what we call low-hanging fruit, you know, that you can kind of grab and walk in the interview and talk about. So follow them on social media uh, is another big thing, uh, an easy thing that you can do right before the interview and ask questions about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the research before you go in is critical. If you don't know what they're doing, what you got yourself into, that's, you really shouldn't be there. And you want to take time to invest into what you're going after, you know, and there's a lot of distractions around. One thing I would say is bring your gear, be prepared to take a weld test, and leave the phone in the car. Don't have any, the minimal amount of distractions you can have around you, the better and more focused you're gonna be on why you're there. And that is really to earn a job, understand what they do, and what opportunities you have with that organization. And that's, that's bottom line for me. I think social media is a big deal too because not only do you want to follow them on social media, but you want to make sure that your social media account uh, is pretty clean too. You know, your, your accounts are not as private as uh, you would like to think. Employers can find stuff pretty easily uh, that could end up costing you your job further down the road. And to kind of back up what you said, Man Cub, uh, if you know that, you know, if you're going in for um, a TIG welding test and you've been MIG welding for a long time, you need to brush up on that stuff. You know, if you don't have a welder in your garage, social media, again, find somebody local in your area that could possibly help you out that you could come over for a couple hours at least and sit there and, and brush up on your skills to get things, you know, up to par. Yeah, that's right, Jimmy. Absolutely. Um, what about resume building? What about, you know, what are, what are some of the things that if you're hiring somebody, you want to see on their resume? I think it's very important that uh, students start out getting used to doing resumes early. Uh, sometimes I've noticed that, that uh, the students try to put them together at the last minute and they, they start putting down a lot of flash and they're overwhelmed and the content has no flow, it doesn't make sense. Keep it brief. Uh, I try to turn it around. I mean, we actually have classes and coursework in actually writing resumes and preparing we do mock interviews and all kinds of stuff but just keep it keep it simple direct uh, make it factual you don't need to put a whole lot of flash behind it and everything just just load it up correctly and, and keep adding to it you know I need to go back and look at mine I, I don't know what it says here for the for the past two or three years I need to I need to add in there that I've been hanging out with Ian and you know 
That's a cool thing. But, you know, seriously, keep it, uh, get used to doing it. As a young person, you need to get used to doing it. You need to be aware of the styles of resumes, what, what HR people look at, uh, you know, what's, what's acceptable, and, and go from there. Yeah, when I was teaching high school, we, we I used to have our kids all do the same thing. You build two, you, well, number one, you build your resume for the job you're applying for. That's step one. So there will be a different resume for every job. If I'm applying for a job with Bob at his college, I'm going to write one style of resume. If I'm applying for a job for me and you want to be on TV, it's going to be a very different resume. If I'm applying, for, that's just the way, it, that's the first lesson I would say is you got to build a resume for the job that you want to apply for. But on top of the resume, I tell everyone, you got to start packing a portfolio together. It's so easy nowadays, just simple on, either on a computer or on your phone, you got to, if you do something really cool, like a project that you were part of, you take pictures, take notes, record all that information, and just put it away, because the resume will get you in the door, may get you the first interview, but when you're in that interview, you're talking, he may say, well, the person in the interview may say, well, tell me, show me some of the, show me something really cool that you've done. And if all you can say is, well, hold on, I may have an idea. Let me tell you about this story. Let me tell One time I went to Alaska, and I, they don't want to hear that. But if you can say, well, here's a picture of a, I worked on this offshore rig, or here's the, that, that'll, that'll show that you're, you're sort of like the next step. So that would be my advice. Resume for every job and start building a portfolio. Uh, definitely. How many, how many students do we have here? Perfect. How many, how many of you are taking advantage of your career resource center? A lot less hands, that's what I thought. How many of you have a career resource center at your school that are not utilizing that? They stay up to date, that is their job, that is what they are trained to do, to help you make a good resume to gain employment because most schools are valued or critiqued, graded off their job placement rates. Not just how many people complete the program, but they wanna see the success stories. So if you're not taking advantage of the career resource center, your career officer, go in there, talk to them, start a conversation. They have resume classes. I used to do resume classes specifically for my students, right? Check the alignment, make sure, check your spelling. Do not use LOLs and ROFLs and, and, and different acronyms that you guys would use on social media or text. Don't type the resume up on your phone. I mean, open up a Word document, go in there and make sure everything is nice and aligned. Check your font, check your sizing, spacing, all that good stuff because the average person that's gonna run your interview, they're, they work for HR. So you can show that you have attention to detail just in your resume. They look at your resume for about 10 seconds before it goes into the trash can or the pile of potential candidates, okay? So that's one thing I would, I would say is use those career resources. Uh, do not pay somebody to write your resume, okay? If you do that nine times out of 10, they're gonna just build you up to be something that you're not. And then be honest during the interview process. If you're not familiar with something, don't fake the funk because they're gonna be able to smell that, right? So be honest in your resume. Anything that you put on your resume is fair game. Okay, I can ask you about that. You said you, you're proficient with GTAW. Okay, tell me exactly what GTAW is. And you're like, ah, I, probably, I probably shouldn't have put that in there. I'm not as, you know, everything that you put on that resume is fair game, right? So be open and honest. Um, that's, just, that's just kind of a look into who you are. If you're lying to me during the resume process, I can't trust you as an employee. So take advantage of the career resource officer um, and, you know, put everything together nice and easy. One thing I also like to say is, print out on high quality paper, okay? You print out, you take, put a little bit more attention to detail. Have your resume available in a PDF format so that you can email it and all of your, your context and alignment, all that stuff is gonna stay the same as when you email it to when they receive it. Keep some hard copies because you never know gonna, who you're gonna run into. How many of you students have resumes on you right now? One, you're at the world's largest metal fabrication expo well, Northeast or North America, you could be passing out resumes right now while you're here, networking, making opportunities. So that's one thing. Keep keep a stack of them in your car or in uh, in your briefcase and pass those out as needed. I say uh, bring bring your certifications. Always bring your certification, guys. One time I left them at home. It cost me an interview. It cost me a job because talking talking don't mean nothing. You show me that you could well. Show me you could dance. You know what I mean, talking anyone could talk. And since we're young, I'm young, they don't believe if you did all this stuff. You know what I mean? Show them that you did all this stuff. Take pictures like Ian was saying. You want to just, hey, I can do this. I can weld. I can machine. They want a person like that, especially when they're young. Do every trade. Even if you're like, oh, sorry. Thanks, Chase. Even if you're um, kid welding, stick welding, machining, write all that stuff down. But take pictures, show them. 
show the name of the shops that you uh, worked at, what years, even if you take pictures of your work inside the shop, always do that. I mean, always show proof, and always be honest, don't lie, don't be, show, show off and be like, oh, I'm such a great welder and all that. Be humble, be honest, and always keep your mind open to learn something new all the time. This is a loaded one for me because this is a, the bulk of what I do all day, so I can really give you guys a lot of tips. But one of the bigger things I would say is, especially if you're a student fresh out of school, you probably have never had an actual welding job before. So you need to list any job that you've had, especially if it's something like landscaping, because then you're demonstrating to me you can work outside. Right? You're already showing me you have good work ethic. You can work in the elements. You can work outside. You're comfortable in bad weather. Um, Another thing I would say is put welder on there somewhere. Somewhere in the first like six inches of the page because otherwise you're not really going to know um, based off of all your previous jobs like if you've worked for your dad's company or you've worked for some uh, you know Johnny's Pizza before nothing says welder in there so how am I supposed to know that's, that's a job you're looking for and you're qualified for it if that's all you've applied to if you don't have welder on there anywhere. So if you've got certifications make sure they're on your resume and listed. Um, another thing I say is email a copy of it to yourself. 100% do not send a Word document out to your employer. Save it as a PDF and email it to yourself. You can get jobs standing here talking to people. They want to see your resume. If it's in your email, all you got to do is forward it. So it's super easy. Even if you don't have something on hand, keep, keep a copy on you. And most people, the easiest thing to do is just email it to yourself. So I always tell people, save a PDF, email it to yourself so you have it on hand and keep welder in there somewhere in the top part of your resume because otherwise a lot of times we don't know that that's other than the fact that you applied to a welding job that you're actually qualified for it so I get to the bottom of your resume so keep that uh, keep those things in mind absolutely um, to add to that you know having a portfolio that you have access to and you can get that into a PDF and share that with them if they ask for it or you can you know produce it that's truly important having the documentation to back up you know the stuff that you have put down on your resume and then I think to look outside of you know the welding a little bit if you did machining or something that relates why not include that as well and that's you know anything you can do to bolster is going to be important what about the uh, age-old debate of union versus non-union Bob? <laughs> you want me to tell my experiences with that? Yeah. All right, I'll be very honest with you. Um, I started out in the 70s. I graduated in 76. I went to uh, two years of drafting and design school. I was still working at the time, working with my dad as well in the oil field. And there was a local, uh, I'm sorry, I'll back up a little bit. I also went to uh, Oregon Institute of Technology in Klamath Falls, Oregon. I worked as a construction millwright. I came back to the Midwest, started working with my dad a little bit more in the oil field, and I started working in fab shops around Punk City, Oklahoma. And I tried to get into the local union at the time of 767, and I couldn't get in. I didn't have a brother or an uncle or a dad. I, you know, I didn't have any relations in this union, and I thought, well, that's kind of not right. It's in their mission statement not to do that. One of those deals uh, passed up numerous times. I only had I only had one person really bucking for me, uh, and I, it was kind of frustrating. Uh, you know, I know I could do the work. I know I could. I was accurate in my dimensions. I was accurate in, in quality, and I just it was one of those deals. Just kept getting passed up, and it was at that time in the oh, I mean, you know, I do a lot of con uh, contract project work and stuff. I'd do a project, get laid off, you know, and I just got kind of frustrated. I had an offer from a buddy of mine out in Las Vegas. I'd been doing an, into professional bowling for a long time, and it's just, I just took another path at, at that moment, and uh, he made me an offer to come out and work in the pro shop out of his pro shop in Las Vegas, of which I was very familiar with, and so I did. I sold my house in Oklahoma and moved out, and I got into the professional bowling game for quite a while. Uh, I came back to fabricating, but you know I couldn't get in. I couldn't get in. I've worked non-union. I've enjoyed it. My pay scale at the time by doing all these different project works, uh, people were familiar with me. I, I was within a dollar or two of union wages anyway. 
I wasn't, I wasn't uncomfortable, but uh, it's just that was my path. That was my experience, uh, and I just I kind of bailed out and said I'll go do something else for a while. Uh, as soon as I left, they opened the floodgates and let everybody in. Timing, I guess, you know. It's all timing. It, you know, it's timing. Uh, anyway, that's just my personal experience. I don't, I, I put a lot of my students into a, a Wichita 441. I, I know the well trainers. I know the business agents. I don't have anything either way of uh, non-union union. Uh, that, that's not an issue with me. I know I tried. I, I support them. Uh, in every right, uh, I'll try to support anybody. Job shop quality personnel uh, with my students that are graduating, uh, or if I went back to work, I'd you know I'd do the same thing. Actually, I am at work, aren't I? <laughs> I think the union is no different than the job itself. It, it's it's going to be a different fit for every person. I've worked union, I've worked non-union, I've hired union, I've hired non-union. I think it just boils down to. Is it a good fit for you? If it's a good fit for you, some people are all about it. Some people, they get that patch and they're super proud and, and they live or die by that. Other people jump in and out and, and play both sides of the fence. And some people never want to go in. I think it's honestly, it's a personal choice. And you, that's a decision that you guys have to make. You might find a union job that you think is great and you'll work it for the rest of your life. Or you may never join a union. I think that's just how it works. I think it's different for every single person. I'm, uh not really biased one way or the other. I've worked uh, a structural steel background. I've worked non-union, and I worked for Iron Workers 808 out of Orlando, Florida. Uh, had I not gotten into education and, and welding training, I'd probably still be with the Iron Workers 808. I'm not a 100% pro-union because they have their their positives and negatives just like everybody else. And just to echo what Ian and Bob's saying, it's got to be a good fit for the individual. Once again, that goes back to doing your research on the employer. Is that something you want to get into? Uh, it was great. I mean, our local did uh, apprenticeship training. They took it very serious. It's one of the top-rated ironworker training facilities in the United States. So I, I received a good education, uh, rigging, welding, structural, uh, rebar tying. Not fun, but, I mean, I learned how to do it. Uh, so it all depends on what you want to do, where you want to go. Uh, and then you have to be okay with if somebody's there with you and they're not pulling their weight and they're a journeyman, they're getting the same amount of money you are. So mentally you have to be prepared for that right so it all depends you know if it's a good fit for the individual or not so that's that's kind of my take on it so so back in May of 2009 when I got out of Hobart but right before I graduated from Hobart there was a bullet makers 154 I did three three and a half years four years in that and we, my town it was a small town Smithfield Ohio uh, there was just people working out of the bullet makers 154 they're like my dad was talking to him like hey take ASME section 9 test so when I was at Hobart, I was going night classes, so I paid uh, Hobart to take an ASME Section 9 test, 350 bucks, I took two different ones, and since I got that certification pass, I did two tensile pulls and two uh, bends, and that certification helped me to get in the bullet makers. I didn't have no friends, no families there, nothing at all. I showed up on their doorsteps in Pittsburgh, PA, about an hour from there I lived, uh, just walked in there with all my certifications. They weren't interested in me at first at all. Came back again. Uh, they started seeing my initiative coming there. Uh, after they sent me, the first two months, I didn't get no calls, no nothing. But I showed up every day for 10 hours, and they had like a little welding lab outside in the snow, in the rain. I'd be out there rain running a welder every day if I'm not working at my dad's shop. I was working at my dad's shop, that's it. I mean, if I wasn't working there, I was up there showing my initiative and learning. I mean, as soon as they seen that, boom. I was, still wasn't welding. I was actually doing stuff for the carpet union, through bullet, bullet makers, building scaffolds. I mean, I was taking any job I could get so I could show, show them that I could, I could do anything. I mean, that's what it took off for me. That's about it. Yeah, it was worth it. I mean, I seen everything. I mean, I traveled the U.S. It was beautiful. Met so many smart guys. I mean, took me on my under their wing. Been to power plants. I mean, it's incredible the power plants. I mean, you learn, you'll see stuff. I mean, it's so big you feel like an ant in them. I mean, it's incredible. You see the turbines. You see all the cool reactors. I mean, it's just it's like wow. You get all cold chills just walking through the plants because it's such an amazing feeling just going through there. I'm with these guys. I think there's good unions, there's bad unions. Some of them have more benefits than others. 
it's really what you're looking for, just like you would look for in an employer. So some, some unions have great educational benefits. They have great apprenticeship programs. Uh, and they're solid people, but there's bad eggs in every, <laughs> in every basket. I think everybody agrees with that. Um, so it's, you kind of have to, I, one, you do have to do some research, but you have to determine if that's what's right for your lifestyle right now. If you're young and you want to get after it and all you want is per diem and you want to travel, sometimes unions are great for that and sometimes they're not. Sometimes, you, you know, they want to kind of hang you out in an apprenticeship program and work your way up and a lot of their jobs are local. So maybe that's not for you right now, but it may be for you longer term down the road. Um, they do have great insurance for a lot of people. So when you start a family, maybe that's something you want to look into there. Maybe you do want a lot of education right now while you're young and you want to build. Um, and so some of these unions have great education benefits. So I'm not pro or, you know, I don't really have one preference on the one way or the other, but I think you need to figure out what works for your lifestyle right now. So you need to talk to some people that work for the union and do some evaluation and figure out what, what are you getting with your union dues from that union uh, that benefits you in the long run. So hopefully if, you're, if you have some goals in mind, you can kind of evaluate what what benefits they have that work for you right now. If they don't, you know, don't be afraid to move on. It's okay. There's other things out there, and you can always come back to it. Yeah, absolutely. Finding the right fit, I think, is the main thing. You want to be happy at the end of the day. You're doing something you love. You like welding. Why not be happy doing it? You have to, you know, and it, you might have to test the waters. And to do that, you just got to take the plunge, check it out, do your homework, and really just try to understand what each is all about and what they have to offer for you. I've talked to some students who uh, were very surprised when once they got out or, or found out that you're not gonna be working a 40 hour week when you get into this. This is, this is a, a, a misconception I think that some students uh, have. Um, have you dealt with, with any students that were shocked with about how many hours you were actually going to work or how often you were going to be not home with your family and the sacrifices that you actually have to make to really become successful in this business? I have had numerous occasions where uh, a young person would come back to me and say, gee, I wish I would have been a little less of a class clown and paid attention because everything you said was absolutely true. Show up two minutes late, you might as well go home do it twice and you're done for three days with no option of overtime for that week or that pay period. And they go, uh, yeah, that, it's serious. It's, it's everything you said. Uh, you know, I read some, I read some books here over the, over the summertime is like, if you want to be successful, work a half a day. <clears throat> you can pick the first half or the second half, 12 hours, you know, I, you know, some students get the misconception that their job is going to be right across the street and they can part-time it and it's cool, you know. I think that's how they grew up. Uh, us old-timers, we know that you got to you got to put in a day's worth of it. So, uh, you know, there's 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 young people that, that obviously have that good work ethic. That's not a question with them. I think it's how they're growing up these days, and, and I really think that some students are mature. They take it seriously. They know they're going to have to put some hours into it. They want to work long hours. Uh, they want the opportunity for overtime. So, you know, I, I've had some really, really good students that are, they know that the long hours is, I mean, that's where they want to be. They want to be successful. I've had some that's like, I'll oh, find me something part-time I'm good with that I don't do part-time jobs so I'm on TV so I don't work at all Jimmy <laughs> <laughs> no I think uh, just to spin off something you said Bob it's one thing to remember you know um, and I always tell myself I have an 18 year old in college so I'm to blame for this dude you know everyone says that this generation of young kids man we raised them we gave them trophies for showing up so it's our fault too but uh, I think that uh, you know, it is funny because, you know, as I said, I, I'm on TV, so I don't work. But it's not true. I actually do work. Um, but I think every job, if you have, get a job that you like, it really doesn't matter if you work 8 or 12 hours. You'll, you'll work the job. I mean, I love my job. I've been very fortunate to have many. I, I've never, when I was a mechanic, I liked my job. When I was a teacher, I liked my job. And who doesn't like being on TV? So, um, for, but I still work. I mean, when we're doing deadline, get a car done. We had to get a car done to get it out of SEMA. I mean, it's 20 hours a day. Five day, the last 10 days before SEMA, and then it goes on a trailer, and we haul it out to Johnson Valley. John was with me, 
And man, it's it's when when you work those twenty hour days, you hate life, even though you're working building cool stuff for yourself and for a TV show. But when you're dropping that sucker into third gear in Johnson Valley, California, doing eighty six mile an hour across the desert, you forget about those twenty hours. And it's no different just any job. When you get done the project, like you were saying, a power plant and these big plants, when you look back and you can say, Holy cow, I freaking built this, you're gonna forget about those twelve hour, eighteen hour days. You will, trust me. I kind of let them know up front, you know, when you get into class, it's not going to be a 40-hour work week when you're done. Uh, I have students that graduate, you know, we go from a 24-hour week program where they got Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays off, and they step right into a job where they're putting 72 hours a week in. I kind of let them know ahead of time, hey, this is, this is what you're signing up for. You know, I don't sugarcoat at the beginning of class. I tell them welding sucks. Everything's sharp, hot, and heavy. So you got to have, you have to have a passion to do what we do, right? You have to love what you do. Uh, kind of like uh, what they were saying, you know, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. So be prepared for those hours. I mean, you're going to put in a lot of hours. You're going to build a lot of cool stuff. You're going to reap the benefits. You know, do it while you're young, but, you know, you're, you're not going to walk in and punch the time, or time clock 8 to 5, you know, and, and, and walk on out. Uh, and then be prepared to travel, not just travel around the country. I mean, uh, I haven't had a job where I've had an un under one hour commute one way uh, since 2005. So be prepared to get in your car and drive somewhere to get the job that you want. Uh, a lot of students, you know, they don't they don't want to travel. They want something right next door to their house. Well, you better move where the work's at. So just be prepared for that as well. Go when you're in welding school, put your helmet down, stay in that booth all day. Burn them rods, burn that filler wire all day, nonstop. Leave that hood down. Don't mess around. Don't talk to your friends. You know, I mean, when you're in there, weld, weld, weld. You're there to learn. You want to be basically almost 100% when you get out of welding school because when you want to go in to a job, you want to be basically good at welding. You don't, you don't even want to think about how to run that weld. You just want to be natural. I mean, leave your phones down, just weld all day. I mean, you're there. Either your mom paid for it, your dad. Just don't waste their money. Always focus on the school. In high school, I didn't focus on school. I didn't like, I just didn't like it. So I wish I took that serious. Everything made sense with my hands. So I started noticing that when I was like 18, 19. I thought, I never told anyone I was, in mechanics, I grew up in my, my dad's machine shop. I was always afraid telling people oh, I'm dirty and greasy. I mean, I was a prep in high school. Now I don't even give a crap anymore. I mean, be yourself, be who you are, and be proud of it all the time. I mean, that's one mistake I wish I never, never did. Like, just lie to people about that. Always just show who you are. Um, time is money, so it's a good consequence or a bad consequence. So. You can either look at it like you're about to get a lot of overtime and make bank, or you can look at it like you're investing in yourself and your skill set and you're investing in your coworkers. So you're building a reputation when you, you're at, when you hit 40 hours and then you keep going, your boss is paying attention. So if you have a crap attitude and you're not prepared, you don't want to be there, you're complaining, the weather's bad, you got to go home, girlfriend's calling, mom's calling, whatever, there's always an excuse. I mean, it matters after 40 hours. Your, your reputation will connect you to your next job way faster than your resume will or any website, Indeed, or whatever you want to call it. Any of your friends, some of you got dirtbag friends, don't network with them. Like, you know, be careful about that. So, like, your reputation is everything, and this is when you build it. And when you start hitting past 40 hours, like he was saying, I mean, you really see people who, for who they are. If you got a bad work ethic, it'll pop out at 40 hours, I can tell you that right now. And, we're, and your boss is paying attention, so keep that in mind. Yeah, I mean, putting the hours in is one thing. And I think a lot of coming fresh out of school, I remember being, you know, welding maybe for a few hours in the day. You go eat lunch and you don't come back for a few hours or whatever it was. But when you're walking around on the site and you got a hard hat on and you're not just welding the whole time, maybe you're doing material prep moving things around i mean that's a whole nother ball game 12 14 hours a day be prepared and understand that it may not always be just welding 100 percent of the time um, and that's that's an important piece to you know take a look at as well that's all the questions that i have so we're going to take a little bit of a unscripted turn here and i'm going to open it up to all of you out there do you have any questions for any of our panelists up here anybody raise your hand Wow, you guys took it all in. All right. Well, cool. Well, uh, please give everybody a round of applause.
Thank you so much for coming to the Employment After Welding School panel here at the Aesop University, and thank you very much. Thanks for coming out, everyone. Thank you.